Hey everyone, welcome to my channel. Feel free to become members if you so desire. Today we are going to be talking about human evolution. The much anticipated book by Standing for Truth will be out soon, and I thought it would be fun to do an overview of the subject to get everyone interested. Today, we have two kinds of people in the world. We have those with such good imaginations that they really believe banana plants and whales are related, and that man is just an ape. Yes, they literally believe cladistics is scientific proof of that. This is the sad state of affairs which have left us literally talking to walls. We might as well just be talking to our cat most of the time. So I thought today we would try a new approach. Rather than just show them evidence that is on our side and explain why the evidence best proves young earth creation rather than evolution, let's show them out of their own books that they were lied to. So let's begin, shall we? In the book, Early Man, by Life Magazine, one of the most popular March of Progress charts ever sold exists inside of it. More schools have this image hanging up than any other image regarding human evolution. But let's actually zoom in and read what the small print actually says. First we come to Pliopithecus. You will notice it says, long considered to be an ancestral gibbons, the Pliopithecids are now known to be far removed from gibbons, or indeed any other living primates. So they admit that this doesn't even belong in the very chart. And it's the first step of this process, and it says underneath it that it's not true. Don't. Now, on to the next one, which is another supposed intermediary, which to them would now be the first step of man, which is proconsul. Well, they consider it a very early ape, an ancestor to the chimpanzee and perhaps the gorilla. So we have another pure ape, which they still cannot identify as to what species it even is. But yet, there it is, standing up, representing human-like bipedalism. That is strike two, but let's move on. Next we have Dryopithecus. We read that after investigation of the skull, rather than evolving earlier than the great apes was as previously thought, it was actually just a great ape itself. A knowingly admitted lie right there in front of your eyes. I give this strike three on proving any human evolutionary tree whatsoever, and we've only looked at three. So literally, their entire first links of the chain are admitted to not be part of the chain in the small print underneath. That would be strike three. Next we have Oreopithecus, and this is hilarious because they start off by literally saying this is a side branch of the human family tree, meaning, yet again, it is not part of the March of Progress chart that it's on. And they are showing you it is part of the human lineage. But let's keep reading. Oh look at that. It was clearly an aberrant ape. Shocker, I know. You will also notice that it is standing upright and walking when they know it's a lie. That would be strike four. Next we have Ramapithecus. This was thought to be a distinct genus that was the first direct ancestor of modern humans before it became regarded as that of the orangutan ancestor again portrayed standing erect and walking, so strike five, another fraud on the chart, shown in the March of Progress that doesn't belong there. Strike five. Oh, man. Next, a famous one, Australopithecus africanus. It tells us, they possessed the brain size of apes, had ape-like skulls, and was similar to body size and shape to apes. So if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, shaped like a duck, the size of a duck, then surely it's a duck, right? Yet, 
there it is, an admitted ape species with the characteristics of an ape in the human family tree portrayed walking just like humans. They don't even try to say anything about it being transitional or having any features of transitional because it's clearly an ape. But again, do you notice anything in the image? Is that really the truth that they're trying to sell you? No, it's not and not even close. It was a primate, nothing more, no transitional, strike six. Now we have Robustus. It states below in the fine print. He represents an evolutionary dead end in man's history. So what's it doing on the chart? He's an admitted dead end on the very chart itself, meaning not part of the human evolutionary march of progress chart that they're showing you. And yet there it is anyway. They know that nobody reads this fine print. But here is something most people don't know. They changed its name to Paranthropus robustus, and that's how it's known today. Do you know why? Because para means beside, and anthropus means man. So it means beside man, meaning not leading to modern day man. Not only was it a different lineage, but an entirely different evolutionary branch than us. Yet there it is on the flow chart, leading from primitive primate ape ancestor to modern day man. Another lie. Strike seven. Dude. So now, let's look how far in we are. Notice that? Halfway through, and every single one is an outright ape. Nothing but a primate. Nothing but pure lies and frauds admitted in the very fine print below each and every one. And if that's not bad enough, if we open this poster and go to the far left, there's something written. And at the very bottom, we read, Although proto-apes and apes walked on all fours, all are shown here standing for the purpose of comparison. Sure it is, everyone. They want you to see them as human-like as possible because they know that pictures are worth a thousand words and they know nobody's going to read that small print and it's going to look and appear as though apes became humans slowly over time when it's nothing but pure lies. Here is why I call BS on this pathetic statement they made. One, we can clearly see that it's not true. If it was true, they would have all had straight parallel backs, like step one and the final step being human. Yet, we see the third primate in the chain on all fours. And then the next ones slightly bent over less and less the farther you go down the chain, portraying that they were getting better at standing upright. It has nothing to do with comparison. If they wanted to compare them, they would have all had them doing the exact same pose. So that is another outright lie. Let's look closer at these features they show. Notice the human is minimal in body hair. Yet, they start showing the two primates before him with less and less body hair, trying to swindle in as though they are slowly losing fur over time when we all know there is zero evidence for any of that. So, another lie. Then we see primate faces that begin to shrink away until all of a sudden we have modern day man. But notice the difference? Man has long hair on his head. No primate does, nor can grow it. Man has a long beard. Primates cannot grow a long beard either. Man has hands that are only found on humans, but they want to try and show that primates doing things that only humans can do, like holding a club as a weapon. Lastly, you will notice that human feet are now placed on two of the primates before him on the chain. More visual lies. So these subtle visuals that they are lying about in the chart are a form of indoctrination to spread disinformation while underneath it telling you the truth, that these are just primates. And the physical evidence that we have doesn't portray what they tell you it does. These are all lies. We have many huge physiological differences between us and apes, but they want you to think that we are just kissing cousins. 
Everything from our hair, our brain, our eyes, our lips, our tongues, our hearing, our visuals, our strength, our skin, our posture, our gut floor and digestion, our appendix, our muscles, the subcutaneous layer of fat that runs under our skin that apes don't have. The list goes on and on, but they want you to think, and they want to portray to you, that they are right next to us and that we popped right out from them along the chain of human evolution. Humans do not speciate. We did not come from another species, and we will not speciate in the future. Now we get into humans, with no transitions whatsoever. The first thing I want to point out is, look at this human that they have here. Do you notice something? Do you notice that he is not an African? Why is that? They believe it is. So why does he have no African traits? They want to have them appear as the average Caucasian for some reason. Yet, it's not what they believe. Just more subtle deceit. And they even admit that they're guessing. <laughs> so let's read this together. It is a revealing story, not only for the creatures it shows, but also because it geographically illustrates how much can be learned from how little. What do they mean by how little? Well, actual evidence, that's what. Let's keep reading. Many of the figures shown here have been built up from far fewer fragments of a jaw, some teeth perhaps, as indicated by the white highlights, and thus are products of educated guessing. Ah! Let that sink in. They admit that these are hypothetical, imaginary drawings made from educated guesses. This is the best evidence they have for human evolution. Nothing but pure SpongeBob imagination assumptions, in their own words. But let's move on now to humans. First, we come across Homo erectus. The illusion in the Time Life book is based on entirely different fossils. <coughs> the Tanurka fossils were unearthed during and after the early 1970s. Before that, Homo erectus stature could only be estimated from two discoveries. One in Java, the other in China, from femur bones. Now that we have more complete skeletons and fragments, we have even more of the story. They state, first man of our genus, modern limbs, but more primitive hands and brain. But let's investigate that. Oh, look at that. Modern day research has discovered that modern day fingers and hand bones have been discovered, and they actually turned out to be the same as ours. Shocker, I know, right, creationists? But if that's not bad enough, the brain size is far more similar to ours and far from other primates. They have tried to say that these ancestors of ours were smaller than us, and this proves that we are evolving larger, and the same with their brains. But this is not the case, as we have found some of them were even six foot one. And now we know that brain size has to do with the culture of the people and where they are living and what they are eating. The most complete skulls that we have show us that a lot of isolated tribes all have the same thing in common. Smaller skulls and brains and some bone abnormalities, usually the ribs and spine. The average African's height is five foot five and a half inches, but then we go to the Netherlands and it's five foot 10 inches. So conditions play a huge factor on height and brain and skull. And if that's not bad enough for evolutionists, they recently discovered they were sailors and had language and navigation skills. Clearly, this is not a primate or some missing link ancestor to the human species. Just look at how they depict Homo erectus still to this day. If this isn't visual indoctrination using pure frauds and imagination to push a narrative, I don't know what is. Let's not take my words for it. Let's go to a paleoanthropologist himself. Listen to what he says, or I should I say, listen to what he admits. This is regarding height, by the way. On the very bottom, we read, it's a case in the fossil record where discovering more seems to have resulted in us knowing less. But that's just because we can now reject several categorical statements that people used to accept uncritically. You see what he's saying here? He's admitting that their bias is in their own way. They cannot break the paradigm. It must be true, so it's rooted in their brain like a dogma. 
Something they cannot question, something they cannot fathom not being true. They are indoctrinated to believe it and cannot critically think of an alternative, because it must be true. And this is one of many reasons why evolution theory isn't science at all. And the sooner you wake up to that, the better. Next on the list you can see early Homo sapiens, but if you read the small print and you investigate what the three they're talking about are, they're now classified as nothing but Neanderthal. So we're just going to ignore this because it's nonsensical and another fraud that should have been removed from the list, so we're just going to move on to the next one. And next on the list we have Solo Man. In the small print, we can read, An extinct race of Homo sapiens in Java. Solo man so far is only known from two shin bones and some skull fragments. Ah! That's right everyone, that entire picture is made up. Shocker, I know. Next in the list we have the famous Neanderthal. It says in the small print, not nearly as brutish of a fellow as his name has come to connote. You see, over time, the depictions of Neanderthal have changed greatly. He first started out as basically Bigfoot, a total primitive creature covered in long body fur. As time went on, they couldn't ignore the facts, and they had to convert him to a modern-day human being that really looks no different than some people that are alive today. But let's go on. Next we read, They had the cranial capacity, in some cases, larger than that of modern man. And he made a variety of tools advanced in design. Now think about that. Larger skulls, larger brain, and yet supposedly lived far before us. And were more primitive and stupid. That doesn't line up with what we see. You can't just find a skull that is smaller than another one, then line them up next to others and say this is proof of gradual upward evolution. Then find skulls that are the exact opposite of that idea, which are much larger, and then use the opposite explanation to explain the same outcome. This is what's called political doublespeak, and they resort to this all the time. This is what they love to do and have to do when the evidence contradicts the story they invented. They never predicted to find what they did with Neanderthal and Denisovan. As a matter of fact, when Darwin himself first saw the popular Neanderthal skull, he said, Some skulls of very high antiquity, such as the famous one of Neanderthal, are well developed and capacious, meaning having lots of room. And that was it. He moved on as though it never existed and never brought it up again, ever. Why do you think that is? because it completely contradicted his theory. Even Huxley admitted this and said that this proves evolution is not a slow gradual process that Darwin speaks of, but it must move in fast jumps. Here they are looking at something that does not line up with what they predicted. This is a falsification of that theory right in front of their eyes. And that's why even though this skull was the most famous and popular skull at Darwin's time, he never talked about it. Critics who know nothing about the biblical model of ancestry always bring up inbreeding, like it's somehow a problem for our model but not theirs. They think that Noah and his children would have an inbreeding problem after getting off the ark. Let me take a brief moment to explain why inbreeding is not a problem and how Neanderthal and Denisovan fit into the biblical perspective and why it makes way more sense than the story they've invented around these people and why over the decades they've been falsified time and time again. First, no. Inbreeding was not a problem for Noah's offspring because of one major factor, population growth. God knew this because he created us and gave us two rules from the beginning both to Adam and Eve, and then again to Noah. 
It was be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. What is funny about this is that evolution theory does have an inbreeding problem. Just ask Darwin himself. <laughs> Just kidding. But you see, small populations over long periods of evolutionary time would lead to horrible problems. One that proves evolution cannot actually happen. Imagine small populations of people living for many tens of thousands of years from bottleneck to bottleneck to bottleneck. Then, after the last bottleneck about 200,000 years ago, humans are stuck in Africa in small tribes for something like 150,000 years, inbreeding. How could this be? It's nonsense, and genetics tells us it's nonsense. Humanity would have died out long before any of this story played out. If this was the case, there would be far more genetic evidence of fixed substitutions in the human population, especially with a fast mutation rate and how few fixed substitutions there actually are, there can only be one explanation, and that is mankind is not old. There are no other options, people. So not only are they mocking the concept that doesn't have an inbreeding problem, they actually forget how bad of an inbreeding problem their own model has. Oh, the irony in all of this. But they have put their foot in their mouth yet again, and they go on and say that it's not just people, but animals as well that would have an inbreeding problem, and that there is no way Noah's Ark could be true because of it. Sadly for them, we literally have examples of this bottleneck scenario playing out, proving that this is not a problem yet again. You see, the Bible gives an account that God sent Noah two of every kind of animal and seven pairs of the clean. These animals got off the ark to migrate around the world and repopulate the earth. That is what Noah took them for. So, if this was true, could we just take two animals of a single kind and place them on, let's say, an island and see how they do, see if they can survive from incest? Oh, look at that. The answer is yes. This exact thing happened in 1957 when we took a single pair of mouflon sheep and left them on the Kruligan Islands near the Antarctic Circle. In 1977, when they returned, the number had grown to 700 sheep. That's just 20 years being stuck on a small island. And considering male sheep are nomadic travelers by nature, yet they couldn't being isolated, this utterly proves that even though the conditions which were not even suitable for them, yet they had no problems whatsoever. And given that the population began with only two individuals that were isolated on an island, the researchers had the perfect sample to test this inbreeding scenario of a bottleneck and what would happen. Their biased belief in evolution made them predict that this could not be possible, yet it did, and the study confirms it. And it shows, even in their writing, how shocked they were and at how unexpected this was. But this is just one of many examples of this scenario playing out in real time, which falsifies a global bottleneck scenario inbreeding problem. The problem is small populations who do not expand in size. And this is what we see with Neanderthal and Denisovan. So this takes us into the next chapter. Who were they? These were just grandchildren of Noah who were just a small group of people who left the population to live on their own and eventually became isolated with a shrinking population and died from incest. And yes, we have evidence for this. They lived together in small groups and reproduced amongst themselves, and that could cause genetic problems. A healthy gene pool needs constant imports and exports of material. It appears that they lived in small groups with perhaps 20 or 30 people. A large clan might have two or three families. These small groups moved over relatively large areas. Well, think about it. How could a small population confined to inbreeding last? Well, that question has been asked, and a new study has found that there is no possible way that Neanderthals could have existed for even over 10,000 years. So much for 400,000 years, huh? 
everything they thought is literally crumbling and falling in between their fingers. And they still can't see the obvious. So yes, Neanderthals are best explained in our model, and everything about them tells us they were just normal people who lived alongside of other humans, and all others today are still related to them in some way or another, because their parents were our grandparents. So of course we're all going to share some genetic relation with them. And yes, even Africans, whom evolutionists denied, by the way, that that would ever be the case. So you see, at first they said they were a totally different species. But then they had to admit, well, they can breed with us. So that idea was removed from them being a different species by definition. Then they tried to say that, well, they're a subspecies, just a different offshoot branch of humans. Then that was falsified when they found Denisovan and modern day people share a lot of genetic similarity with them. Then they said, well, they're not a different species, nor a subspecies, but they're just a single dead-end branch of only the European ancestry through evolution. But then they found that even Africans have their DNA in them as well, so that falsified that idea too. Basically, everything that they once said about them has turned out to be 100% wrong. These were just sons and daughters of one of Noah's grandchildren who decided to live a life of exploration and unfortunately chose to go north. They got lost and they died from genetic disorders from living in small numbers and inbreeding over the thousand years. This also explains their lack of chin, which even modern day Australian Aborigines share because of this inbreeding problem that they have as well. So the last question would be, why don't we share more genetic similarity with these ancient Neanderthal if they just lived a few thousand years ago? Wouldn't it take tens of thousands of years for DNA similarity to be weeded out? Actually, no. And published in Genetics, a team conducted simulations to model what would happen if Neanderthal did indeed occur mutations at a quicker rate than modern humans. What would happen to the offspring shared between humans and Neanderthal? Well, the study revealed that rather than genetic similarity slowly declining over time, Neanderthal DNA in modern human genomes would have been rapidly decreased during the first 10 up to 20 generations. So a time period of less than 600 years maximum, then it would remain unchanged throughout all future generations. And this is exactly what we see. Neanderthals being a product of evolution is falsified. But now let's listen to what evolutionists have to say about Neanderthal and when they flip-flopped on what they once said was a fact. The science constantly changes how we envisage Neanderthals. After the first archaeological evidence of Neanderthals was discovered in the 19th century, many experts described this species as ape-like. A more realistic picture of the Neanderthals evolved decades later. It's sad how they can just get away with pushing lies for decades and then just use the excuse, well, we've learned more now, and then all of a sudden it makes it just okay. But this is evolution we're talking about, so why would anyone expect honesty at, honesty at this point? Were the Neanderthals able to develop a culture as we understand the term today? Expert opinion on this topic is divided, since there's no hard evidence of songs or dances, if indeed they had any. 
No evidence of song or dance. What, do you expect you're going to find a fossil of a Neanderthal dancing as he's dead? What kind of nonsense is this? And of course we know they had songs. Why? Because we've literally found an instrument that they made. <sighs> the insanity at this point is just next level. They cannot break out of the evolutionary mindset. It has hindered them from thinking critically and using basic logic at this point. But let's move on. On arrive à comprendre et à the evidence indicates that there were several groups, and each had its own territory. And once or twice a year, they'd meet at one place to engage in common activity. These meetings would produce the desired results only if the various groups could communicate with each other. Scientists have been studying what sort of language the Neanderthals may have spoken. In any case, these ancient humans do seem to have had the physical capability to speak. But we know that the ear bones of Neanderthals seem to be functioning like ours do for sound transmission, the same range of frequencies, so their hearing certainly would have given them the same capabilities as we have in terms of hearing language. So I think all of that suggests Neanderthals had a basic language. They were talking to each other, they had speech capabilities. Like you're going to go and meet up with a group of people that you're going to be building things with and hunting with and trading with and not even have the ability to communicate to one another? I mean, come on. See, the reason this is so confusing for the evolutionists is because, one, they thought they couldn't speak, have the capacity to speak, nor the brain power to do it. Then they learned, oh, they have all of those, so I guess they could. So, yet again, more evidence against them, and what they used to say. They were nomads, but they lived in a rather limited region, where each site fulfilled a specific function, like extracting raw materials or slaughtering animals. And they created living spaces in sloped areas that protected them from high winds. They knew how to make good use of these narrowly defined areas. And yet, no matter where we look or where we go, whether it's Denisovan or Neanderthal, we find that they had advanced technology for primitive people. Now consider this, imagine you went back in time with nothing except for what you have in your own mind. We would already have an edge based on our knowledge, but could we survive just like they did and then also take the time to make what they made in their spare time? That's pretty incredible actually considering the harsh conditions at the time when they lived. This is after the flood when the Ice Age came down all the way to where they were living. Let's look at some of the things that they created. This, for example, was made by the Denisovans. This incredible object was dated between 40,000 and 50,000 years ago. But just under a decade later in 2017, there was some speculation it was even older, being between 65,000 and 70,000 years old. Although, as far as I can see, this was never confirmed. In 2008, the world's oldest stone bracelet was discovered. The handiwork of a now extinct species, subspecies or population of humans that scientists call the Denisovans. It was found in Stratum 11 of the world famous Denisova cave, located in the Altai region of Siberia. And it truly is one of a kind, showing technical skills in fine stonework long before we ever thought was possible. Whoever it's wearer and whatever its importance, it is a find that fundamentally changed our views on the Denisovans, showing us they were far more advanced than we ever thought was possible. In bright sunlight, the green chloride would have reflected the rays of the sun, and at night, by a fireside, it would have cast a deep shade of green. It is also delicate and very fragile, which is why the experts believe it was worn on special occasions only, and wasn't an everyday object. We can see the smooth, clearly polished, curving outer edge of the bracelet, and the circular drill hole that's running through it, which has a diameter of 8mm. The bracelet is less than a centimetre in thickness, and it has an estimated diameter of around 7 centimetres, shown here on the wrist of a mannequin. Inspecting the artefact, 
and scientists stated that the drill that was used to make the hole had a relatively high speed with minimal fluctuations. Some kind of implement was used, and so the technology for the day was certainly advanced. The Denisovans had clearly mastered skills that were considered uncharacteristic for the Paleolithic. They could precisely drill, grind and polish, even the most intricate of artefacts, and the outcome really is truly stunning. Chlorite was also not local to the cave it was found in, and would have had to have come from at least 200 kilometers away, meaning it was likely a precious and valuable material for the time. Next to the hole on the outer surface, there is a specific zone of polishing, indicating it was in constant contact with some kind of soft organic material. It's possible there was a leather strap attached, likely with a heavy charm hanging from it. The polishing around the hole has helped the experts to distinguish the top and bottom of the bracelet. Although this is the most spectacular find, the Denisova cave has also brought forth many other objects, including a 50,000 year old needle, as well as a ring that's carved out of marble. Here we can see pendants made from animal teeth, as well as tools that were fashioned from bone. This is a 50,000 year old tiara that was made from woolly mammoth ivory, another artifact that shows incredible technical know-how. The Denisovans would have had to remove the tusk from the mammoth, cut it into thin pieces, and then soak it in water before bending it into shape. Then there was scraping, cutting, grinding and polishing, a variety of different techniques to achieve the final product. The Denisovans were clearly sophisticated, and experts believe they were more progressive than both Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. So how and why Homo sapiens outlived them we still don't know. It really is sad how the theory of evolution makes people not see the obvious, but let's move on. Next we have Cro-Magnon Man. They state, only a cultural step away from modern man. The brain capacity was about 1600 cc, somewhat larger than the average modern day human, but produced a variety of sophisticated tools such as retouched blades and scrapers, nosed scrapers, the chisel-like tool, known as a burin, and fine bone tools as well. So they separated Cro-Magnum Man from us originally because of the tools they found. <laughs> Think about that. Let's really look at the difference between them and us, shall we? Oh, look at that. They're actually modern in every anatomical respect to us. What a shocker. Jeez. It's amazing what happens when you actually read the small print that they don't intend for the public to ever read. Forensic investigators find a corpse in a river about a week old, and they can't tell you anything about it. But they find a finger bone in the middle of a field one mile underneath the ground, and they build an entire life story off of it. That should tell you something right there. Evolution theory is, was, and always will be a racist theory at its core that died decades ago. But unfortunately, it's always going to plague our school system and society because it's protected by law and pushed onto our children with no alternative. The sooner people wake up to this reality, the better. Sadly, most will never see the agenda, nor be able to break the indoctrination, even when better evidence is presented. The reason I made such a long series debunking this is because the human evolution chart still plagues the schools to this day, and it is one of the most popular images on earth regarding human evolution. So when someone comes along and tries to say, this is an old outdated chart, remind them, if it's so outdated and worthless, then why haven't they removed it from the classroom? Why haven't they told everybody that the march of progress visual is a lie? Because I agree, it is old, outdated, and 100% worthless. And the fact that they still use it shows how little they care about lying to the public and how little has changed since that time it was made. Including how pathetic the overall evidence for evolution actually is. Since that time, have we actually discovered more missing links, supposedly? Yeah, of course. As long as you want to count frauds upon frauds and lies after lies as missing links, we have a lot. 
but if you actually investigate and can read in between the lies, you will quickly see that the fable falls apart on every one. Every one of them is nothing but, but fancy stories hyped up to sell and get famous from, and get more government grant money, and make a name for yourself in the field of paleontology. That's what it has become all about. They know that all they have to do is just find some new strange anomaly and create a story for a quick headline that makes them very popular. No matter how wrong it is, the public quickly forgets about the fact that it was a lie and retracted later. But we will cover all of these frauds at another time because there are so many. Stay tuned and hit subscribe and follow our channels. And be sure to check out the new book because it's going to cover all of these evolutionary lies and expose them for the frauds they are.